Hello and welcome to episode 27 and the third season of the Nostalgia Bubble Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Shuggy, an amateur film reviewer and nerd. I am Nye, tonight's third wheel. Yeah, because we are joined by a guest. It's another one of our dear friends. It's Mikey Payne. Woo! Hello, hello. Welcome. So so good to finally get you on the on the podcast. It's good to be here. I'm a I'm a I'm a massive fan. So good, to, uh, <laughs> good to contribute. Um, and good to hear we have a fan. Yeah, following in the footsteps of our fourth wheel, Ronnie. She truly is the fourth wheel of the group. Yeah, yeah. So for those of you who don't know, um, Michael, Shuggy, Ronnie, and I are part of a bit of a clan. The dream team. The dream team, indeed. That, that is a, a lovely way to describe it, and I, I, I feel the sentiment attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and as as tradition dictates, it was our guest's choice. So, Michael, go for it. What did you choose? So, I've um, I've I've picked a bit of a um, what I would describe as a wacky film um, from from quite a while ago. Um, and I've kind of loosely interpreted the nostalgia um, part of part of the the title um, as one one of the kind of um, first films that I kind of stood up and paid attention to. If that makes sense. Yeah. So I kind of started look, looking for deeper meanings and started to think think about what what the film was about rather than just being like, oh, there's a cool action sequence. Here. Yeah. Um, so you so saw this film, last year. The film is. <laughs> <laughs> It, 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 one of my lockdown projects. Yeah, no, it's going um, to be this kind of episode, isn't it? <laughs> I blame, blame, blame. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. So I, I, um, I watched this film back back in the day before streaming services, and when um, when I had to stick on Channel Four because I had five channels, and <laughs> and the other the other few were were absolute rubbish or at the time. Um, so the film is A Clockwork Orange. A great by, film. Uh, by Stanley Kubrick, very controversial. Kubrick or Kubrick? Kubrick, I'd go with. And, well, we'll, we'll, we'll go go with your gut, Shaggy. <laughs> You're usually right on things like this. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's um, you know extremely kind of thought provoking and and started to to get me to think about think about what what the director was trying to tell me rather than just rather than just you know there's a there's a cool bit of entertainment here. Yeah. Nice. I think, yeah, it's a great pick. Um, Nye, how did you kind of first come to Clockwork Yeah, um, so I it was it was one of those films that, you know, my parents had thrown around and it was one of those that my dad was constantly kind of badgering me to try and watch. Um, and I very vividly remember being there being a huge Clockwork Orange poster on the co- on the corridor outside the English and media classrooms at our sixth form <laughs> college. I don't know if you remember, guys, but um, I never went upstairs in that building. And and I was um, I was always kind of intrigued by it and wanted to watch it. And then I think I watched it for the first time maybe a couple of years ago, um, and I was incredibly underwhelmed. So when you mentioned it, I was like, oh, okay. And and you know, Stanley Kubrick is not my go-to director um i'm i'm gonna controversially throw out that i'm not a fan of 101 space odyssey is that what it's called 2001 <laughs> 101 dalmatians <laughs> 101 dalmatians <laughs> in space <laughs> who, who knows who knows maybe, maybe nice preempted a uh a stan kubrick prequel that's uh, yet yeah. to be released so um, emma uh, stone is 101 dalmatians in space yeah <laughs> so as you can tell i'm not I'm not a close follower of Stanley Kubrick, um, but on rewatch, actually, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm not just saying that because this is a podcast of positivity. Um, I think, you know, the last time I watched it was probably a bit of a half-assed attempt. So, um, yeah, I I really enjoyed it. The, the whole kind of um, psychological torture element of the film didn't, didn't last as long as I remembered it lasting. Yeah, it's it's um, the bit that sticks in your mind, so it feels like it's a bigger part of it. But it's yeah. a pretty brief scene in there. Yeah, so I think it kind of because of that, my memory of it, it sort of coloured the whole film as a bit more abstract than than it, it is in reality. So um, yeah, I I actually really enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to kind of getting into it a little bit more. 
it didn't really stick out to me as much as The Shining or 2001 or Doctor Strange Love. But I think giving it its time where it's not just part of like a marathon of Stanley Kubrick films and I'm just able to focus in on it, there's a, so much kind of depth to it. I don't think I fully get what Stanley Kubrick's position is. Um, and I think it's going to be a great discussion trying to get into that. Uh, but there's there's tons to unpack here. And yeah, I thought it was, it's a really well-made film. And yeah, it's it's a harrowing watch as well. Like it is pretty brutal at times. And yeah, it's graphic. It, it yeah, is it's a... graphic. yeah def- it definitely uh, it, it's definitely one that sticks with you for for better or worse. Whether you whether you kind of uh, love it or hate it, you you definitely remember yeah, it. Yeah, unquestionably. Okay, I'll run through a very quick bit of pre-production. I don't have too much here. Uh, so. It's originally based on a book by Anthony Burgess, who wrote it in 1962. Uh, he sold the rights pretty much immediately after for about 500 quid, I think. Um, maybe that's dollars. He's probably American. I don't know. No, he'll probably be British. I think it's based in Britain. Um, so he might be British. I didn't look this up. Can you tell? <laughs> um, so the, originally, the Rolling Stones were meant to star, and like Mick Jagger wanted to play Alex, which would have just been a really weird film. Um but there were some problems with the BBFC, which is the British Board of Film Certification, and the rights ended up coming to Stanley Kubrick. Um, he'd been given a copy of the book by a screenplay writer called Terry Southern, but he'd kind of been working on a Napoleon film and was just like so fixated on that, he never read the book. Um, his wife instead read it, and she was like, oh, this is something you should read and like actually do read it and he loved it like again like all the stuff you talked about where you you this was kind of a film that you saw so much in there that you're trying to understand and get deeper into he saw that in the book as well and he wanted to make it um so he wrote a pretty faithful screenplay to it um which is quite rare for him like if you've seen the shining it's quite far removed from the uh, stephen king book so the fact that he was fairly faithful is a quite a big change for Kubrick um, but it was based on the original on the sorry the US printing of the book not the original printing which doesn't have the final chapter which is something we'll get into towards the end of the film I think um, he cast uh, Malcolm McDowell as Alex after seeing a film called If and it was actually Malcolm McDowell who helped develop the kind of signature Droogs look which is uh, he showed Stanley Kubrick his cricket whites and Stanley Kubrick was like, you know what would work quite well? If you put the box on the outside, you know, a la Superman. And uh, that's kind of where that came from. <laughs> I, I never I never put... I've, I've, I've just had to take a pause to think about Superman and the connection between Superman and the Droogs. And that's, uh, that's taken, me, taken me back a little bit. Between that and the number of naked people in this film, the wardrobe department are... Um, <laughs> don't have much of a task on their hands. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, the costumes they do have tend to be pretty outlandish as we are set in a dystopian future. So they, they yeah. still had some work to do. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of all I've got. So let's just dive into this film. Great. Yeah, so this kind of whole opening bit where we're just essentially watching them in their slightly drug fueled violent state going around... Um, I forgot how much of this comes back to play kind of later on. Like, even the old man they beat up at the start, that comes back later on. Um, yeah, but this is just... I, I think this is there to kind of show the levels of violence that are being basically brought out in people in this dystopian future. Well, I don't know, what about you guys? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think my... Um... My kind of initial take from from the o- the opening the opening scene is is first of all the the kind of hypocrisy and the class divide between you've got you've got frankly guys guys in top hats that uh, you're not quite sure are they are they upper class or are they are they trying to be upper class and then and then all of a sudden they're they're out in the street with a cane um, saying how much when they've five seconds ago been doing drugs themselves. When they're saying they absolutely hate the uh, the, the the drunkard in the street because mm. he's singing and he's and there's kind of no no I guess empathy I think you're struck with the complete lack of empathy and you're all, all already kind of getting into the is this guy a bit of a 
a, a sociopath here? What, what's going on here? Unquestionably, some kind of sociopath. There seems to be that kind of moment in the bar at the end of the night where um, he's kind of admiring the the suits um, and and he sort of sees them as kind of almost his sort of socio-economic superiors um and and it, it's a really interesting dynamic sort of that comparison that he draws um and and sort of how that kind of reflects or or, or yeah i guess depicts how he sees himself in society because he's he sort of caught between these two worlds so just sort of the other side of the same coin to what you said mikey with with the way that you know he relates to the drunk guy under the bridge um and he sees himself as above and then he sees himself as below it's just quite a, a bit of a battle and and he it's his, this is almost sort of showing somebody who's kind of tossed around by society and and sort of batted from left to right um and yeah i think it's it's just kind of a a really interesting opening sequence showing that kind of fluctuation from from one to the other phenomenal couple of points there yeah i'd picked up on the same thing mikey did about kind of him comparing himself with the you know the the drunk guy on the street but yeah night that's a really good point about how we then get that comparison with kind of upper class people and the way he does kind of see you know beethoven as this kind of superior you know more intellectual thing and he only respects people with that you know like later on when he's getting interviewed by um frank alexander's colleagues and he's you know telling them how to spell beethoven as if they wouldn't know like one of the most famous composers of all time it's you know he he clearly has this kind of view in his mind of the kind of people who listen to mm. it and he sees himself i think in that kind of bracket and that's where he strives to be and the fact that you know this woman breaks out into singing beethoven he suddenly kind of gains a bit of respect for them and looks up to them in that moment yeah you've definitely got that theme of kind of aspiration throughout the film and that's kind of really really apparent really early on but I guess the, the opening scene is saying that it kind of works both ways and you've got that aspiration upwards, but you've also got that being down downwards mm. of, uh, of, of classes perceived as, as beneath. And that's, again, kind of continued later on throughout the film. Yeah, I, I also like the way that, you know, even at when he's at the lowest of lows, Alex is still trying to aspire upwards. You see, when he's in jail, the first thing he does is he kind of looks for this sort of position of authority whether it's through religion or whether it's kind of um volunteering himself for this program you know it's um it's kind of this idea of uh, progressing above the people around him um and you know this is this is quite a, a i think a poignant moment um in uh, in in time as well i mean you see this is just kind of this is what sort of 30 years 30 25 30 years after the second world war and you've got you know this kind of reintroduction of a society that's kind of rebuilding itself and social mobilization um is is becoming more and more prominent and only sort of within the next 10 years do you see that kind of thatch right era who who is you know basically rooted in trying to inspire mobilization of of the working class and and this is i mean whether this was ahead of its time or i mean i wasn't alive in 1971 so i can't, i can't tell you um but whether this was ahead of its time or just a really good depiction of what was going on at the time i'm not sure but um yeah i think it's kind of it certainly seems to be reflective of something that i definitely know came about after or was or is incredibly prominent and shaped british society afterwards yeah great point keep keep it light now <laughs> <laughs> you'll get used to this you'd know this if you listen to any of the other other episodes <laughs> Also, in this opening sequence, we have the moment where he tricks his way into Frank Alexander's country home and they 
beat and rape his wife um all while singing singing in the rain which is just this really really disturbing sequence um it, it's weird how that kind of came about it wasn't something that was originally in the script and stanley kubrick was like looking for something to make this scene tick and at some point he suggests to malcolm mcdowell oh can you do like sing and dance while you know you're committing all these horrible acts and this was apparently the only song he could remember the words to uh, so Stanley Kubrick just immediately went out and bought the rights to it, uh, which is just like, yeah, go on. Uh, yeah. Casually. Uh, yeah. So apparently when McDowell would later meet Gene Kelly, Gene Kelly just turned around and walked off in disgust because he was so angry of how his song, like the song that he's so well known for was used in the film. It's, it's it's absolutely perfect in in the in the final cut because it adds adds that layer of kind of youthful playfulness and it and the fact that it's I don't know whether it's fair to call it like a almost almost a nursery rhyme but it's it's what kids sing when when they're stomping in puddles and you've you've got just just kids playing and completely lacking that that empathy that we kind of mentioned earlier when they're you know committing atrocities yeah and and the fact it like calls back to singing in the rain from the film that kind of sequence which is just like pure joy it's someone just in a moment of genuine ecstasy dancing around singing having a great time and you go oh these kind of acts are what give these people joy yeah it's i mean it's it's harrowing and it's brutal and i think it kind of uh, married with you know the masks and the the random outfits and the the mannerisms and all of that stuff it feels really kind of like circus like and it's like they're putting on this kind of circus freaky kind of performance um and yeah just i mean a great performance a harrowing scene yeah really really disturbing I think add, adding to that, that's um, that's a really really interesting point. One of the things I kind of noticed, I think, sl- slightly after the scene we're talking about, is um, is the escape in the car, and it's quite um, it's got quite quite the feeling of, of theatre. It's not like um, you're you're you can imagine being in a theatre and seeing seeing the actors kind of jiggling about on the car, um, like if if you're sitting in a in a in a performance, and I think that's that's kind of the feeling that, that Kubrick. Or my interpretation is that he's going for, and then as the film goes on, it starts to get a little bit more of reality, and and you're kind of following following um, Alex's journey as he's like, oh, this is all just a sing and a dance. This is just a show. This is just a performance. Oh, hang on, this is this is this is real life. Yeah, I mean, it's it, there's this kind of especially you're completely right, especially at the beginning of the film. There's this real playfulness about it, which you know is in, it heightens how disturbing it is you know this idea that they're almost like kids I- engaging in this absolutely disgusting they are behavior. they are kids he's literally um, a, stu- a school kid well I think yeah that... you you don't realize until, until that next scene when he's at home and he's told that he's got yeah. to get up for school and then you're kind of like incredibly shocked and taken aback. I back. think um, if I'm not mistaken in the in the book he's he's 15. Yeah. And they wanted they wanted to make it a little less creepy in the film um because they're already kind of pushing the boundaries of acceptability. So I think they they um they kind of aimed for that kind of 17 18 when you're when you're you know right right on the cusp between between yeah. those ages of responsibility. Yeah, yeah, and no, absolutely right. Um but also Malcolm McDowell's like 27 and he's playing like much younger really well like he looks youthful i don't know maybe it's just my picture of malcolm mcdowell is permanently colored as like the old malcolm mcdowell we know now who because i think the first <laughs> thing i ever saw him in was heroes oh uh, it's a mentalist for me oh uh, there you go that's a good one <laughs> but yeah very very much that um that aging villainous character yeah 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 uh, yeah i got i did get in going back to that scene of um in in that the old old writer's home um i did actually get very heavy hints of um of the joker you know it had that kind of 
and and again like i know i've already kind of referred to that clown circus like but i mean when you especially that sort of the the like again the playfulness and but that sort of menacing uh through line of the whole character it it really that that was the image i got in my head with the joker very much the the, um the um the 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 bit where he uh uses his cane to uh to to whack not only the victim but but also his his accomplice and and it's all kind of just uh you, you can you can so see it as a bit of a clown show, like one clown tripping over another clown, hitting another clown. You can you can you can really really see that that's almost performance for kids. Yeah. I also I, family film. <laughs> I also did pick up uh, Nai. You mentioned kind of uh, the the almost fantastical. I think it was Nai. It might have been Michael. The kind of fantastical element, and as it becomes sort of more realistic later on, with this whole kind of first you know few scenes before he's arrested do almost feel like this weird drug trip like everything is so bizarre you know there's all this bizarre futuristic artwork that punctuates everything obviously the stuff in the record shop you know everything's just like it doesn't feel real and then once we hit prison like obviously it's meant to be set in some kind of dystopian future but that just kind of starts to feel a lot more real for the time and a lot more just grounded in a sense of you know what is we would know and uh it just mm. it makes even when they're kind of torturing him psychologically it still doesn't feel like too far removed from a possibility whereas this whole kind of first sequence almost feels like they're fantastical just out there no cares life absolutely yeah uh we also kind of get a little bit in the bar and you've kind of mentioned it michael where he starts to uh hit his own droogs a bit and we kind of get the breaking down of that relationship which then obviously carries into the next day where he full-on fights them and is you know puts two of them into the river and you know cuts dim with his knife um and i think this is kind of like the key moment of fall for him is where he he tries to exert his complete authority over them and fails, and they essentially rise up against him. Yeah, it's it's a real kind of um, really powerful scene because you get like um, the a sense of confusion with Alex on. Hang on, my my my, my friends, my my subordinates are behaving slightly differently. What's going on here? And then you get almost that that moment of clarity, which. Um, which is a bit of an insight into the character of I know I know this solution. Why didn't I think of this before? I'll just beat them up. Yeah, I also think there's kind of a little bit of um, almost a, a kind of connection between Alex as kind of the authority, to, you know, the authority of this group, and kind of what we're seeing of like the authority of the government with him being like the kind of rebel figure fighting out against it yeah that's a really nice that's a really nice interpretation of it it's almost kind of like this this kind of microscopic view Mm. of the wider picture and um and I, i think also again like if you're if you're if we're going back to that point of like him kind of struggling to climb the ranks um and looking for that social mobility like he it makes sense that he would put himself in that position, that he would see himself in that position of authority, because as far as he's concerned, that's what he deserves. Um, and yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's he's, you know, running a dictatorship. Yeah. And I think kind of this is us being introduced to kind of Kubrick's ideas on the whole theme of politics in the in the film before we're even really introduced to the government and their kind of fascist kind of ways and then he gets himself caught well specifically is droogs get him caught i don't know does does he just not read the news like is he not aware that people are going to know his modus operandi that it was literally posted in the newspapers because he just does exactly the same thing on a different house and she immediately calls the police saying this is what happened to that other couple I guess um I guess slight, slightly before slightly before his kind of um second offense or like oh, a se- yeah, yeah. second kind of major operation you've got that really kind of weird scene with the teacher 
where um, he's he's pulling a sickie because he's been he's been out late the night before, and his teacher's just in his house when he, oh, when he think, wakes up. Yeah, I think that's his and, parole officer. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. My bad. I've mi- what's, mi- what's his name? Because they it's, come to um, the jail as well when he's he's arrested. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes, you are right. Um, but it's such a such a weird a weird scene yeah. where he's like um, you don't you don't know whether he's he's a friend or a foe or it, does he have your best interest? Does he not? And uh, and that's kind of one 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 um, my specific point that's that's pertinent is that he says obviously there's no there's no evidence, but but. But I know it's you, yeah. And so you've got this sense that that Alex feels almost almost untouchable because he laughs off the the fact that the authorities know 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 what he's doing, know who he is, and uh, and are keeping tabs on him. But he feels he feels untouchable because because he hasn't been touched so far. Yeah, great point. Yeah, and and I guess when you when you link that back to that kind of authority, that position of authority, and that sort of inflated sense of self. You know, and the way that that reflects, or or the way that that kind of is a mirror image of of what you're, what you see in in the government system and the government structure later on in the film. You know, it's you see that you see him kind of come crashing down, and you very quickly see that in at the end of the film with the government when they come pleading for him to kind of make amends with them. Yeah, I um, think that, publicly. That, that's that's something I, I love throughout the film. It's just the the um, not necessarily subtle, but the, <laughs> like the 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 excellent <laughs> use of, of metaphor throughout. Mm. That all, all the time you you're, you're thinking, does this mean what I think it means, or does it mean something wider? And and exactly that is is a message of you know you can treat people so bad, but there's gonna there's gonna come a breaking point where 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 it it. it it breaks. Yeah. Yeah. And and what I what I quite like is I mean if we're going to get specific with analyzing the metaphor which you know I like to do so so very often <laughs> is you know you, what you see here is you see his friends turn mm. on him um and they are the people that land him in it and I mean maybe this is just the way that I see um I see authority kind of work with its with society now but um at the end uh, i think there's quite a poignant point that it's the media that turns on the government and you know the way that they work so closely hand in hand and and suddenly their their friends are turning on the on them i just thought that that was kind of a bit of a it was just a really interesting parallel oh, no for me the, the media in the government's pocket as their as their subordinates i'd never under see that in what never see that <laughs> Absolutely not. Never. Or or, or, or or the other way around, with the the government being in the media's pocket. You're right. Rupert Murdoch runs things. And yeah. We it. I also just want to throw back yeah. to uh, <laughs> just laugh past that bit. Uh, I also want to throw back to that kind of scene you mentioned, Mikey. Um, the performance by Aubrey Morris as as uh, Mr. Deltoid. It's just a really weird, creepy kind of very exaggerated performance it felt almost like something out of monty python to me yeah absolutely and and you know it was mikey you were completely right that you you're sort of sat there wondering what is yeah. going on like why he's there what his intentions are and i think you know the way that it's directed as well really makes you question it like there's there's this that moment where he kind of lies back on the bed and then grabs him by the by the private parts and you're just like what is this relationship mm. and and really ultimately all it is is it's a show of power and it's an abuse of power but it's kind of it it leaves you wondering exactly sort of how what the what the dynamic is meant to be there um and so i think like you know you can be forgiven for thinking that he's a teacher or he's somebody that the, the family knows personally or like it's a really odd thing. And, and, and I, th- I don't think that that's unintentional. Yeah. Yeah. It's the first, it, it, I think, first time I think you get it, a glimpse of, uh, of Alex's kind of vulnerability and the fact that, that, that he's, he's not just this, um, this, this macho exterior that he's, he's giving off and there, there might be a chink in the yeah. armor. But then on the flip side of that, he he's maintaining his 
is I would call performance and still respecting the authority figure despite the fact that he's 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 grabbing him by the private parts and clearly there, there's the abuse there but but still Alex is playing along again metaphor yeah. to, to society yeah and it's also the first time you see the relationship between authority and citizen and and I think that you know that this is kind of like the bridging point where you start to kind of link the the previous sequence with the rest of the film yeah and i think you see kind of alex's relationship with authority throughout he's at all points he's quite respectful and submissive towards kind of the authority coming from the government like when he is arrested and first comes to jail he you know he is following all the instructions he's calling them sir you know he even though he th- clearly thinks that things are a bit stupid the way they're doing it, where he has to stand behind the line in such a way that it's awkward for him to reach the desk, uh, and yeah, he's having to play stuff properly. You know, he still he follows all the instructions, and he he's as 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 you said, like kind of almost very submissive in doing it. Yeah, he he fully knows how to play the game. He knows that there is a game, and he knows how to play the game, and 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 yeah. And, and you're just kind of follow, following that journey with him. Well, I, the only pushback I'd give on that, though, is that there is, you know, there's this scene where he's being held in um, by the police officers. And obviously, Deltoid comes in as well and, and punches him. And it's almost like, I think this is almost kind of foreshadowing. There's this sort of seeing him getting beaten into submission um, because it's kind of obviously very closely followed by him walking into the prison and he, he knows where he stands now. And although that's not what you expect, you know, it, it's kind of this... Um, it, for me, it seems like a bit of a precursor to, to what's going to happen next. Yeah, you've, you've, got the, you, you've got the shadowy side. You've got, you've got kind of the... the 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 gamification on on the front on the face of it and all the all the happy smiling faces but the, there's a shadowy shadowy side that uh, that happens behind quite literally behind closed doors of of his of his jail cell yeah right and then we cut forward two years into his fourteen year prison sentence um, and we kind of start to meet his uh, Church of England chaplain who is almost I, I mean I. I know that the writer who wrote the original book was a religious person and kind of wanted some kind of maybe theological idea of what it means to be good in there. Um, I am not sure about Kubrick's own kind of beliefs. Uh, He doesn't necessarily strike me as a particularly religious or overtly religious filmmaker. So I don't think he's necessarily going for that. He did make... He did make 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah, which is not actively yeah, non-religious <laughs> exactly um so it's but it is interesting that he kind of kept this character you know the per you know whose kind of philosophy on what being good is is you know goodness comes from within i think i think this is also kind of a way to set up that relationship between the church and the state because that is also something that is you know hugely poignant mm. um even today you know the i mean the for instance the legalization of gay marriage um and how that's basically been that that law has basically been held under the thumb of the church and you know i think so i think that's kind of a, i think that's a really important um element that would have had to have been explored if you were exploring authority but I think the idea that the church is almost kind of the pushback is an interesting one coming from Kubrick. Um, but it might just be that they're a different kind of view on what makes goodness. Yeah, I think this is this is a really kind of interesting debate. So I've got I've got on on the one side, I'm thinking is is it a, just another reflection that um, religion is very much being used as a as a way to control these these inmates. Um, and and is is that is that the the reverend's purpose in that environment as as purely a, a source of control? Because he seems to be rewarding Alex for the 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 good inverted commas good behaviour that he's he's demonstrated, which is very submissive. Is it's un, un, unresponsive? 
I think particularly in the scene where they are all singing kind of, I think they're singing some kind of hymn, it very much is kind of representing that. You're right. There's a fantastic bit of dialogue in that scene where um, where the Reverend talk, is, is giving his sermon and he's talking about... Um, He's talking about you've got to reform, otherwise you'll end up in and out and in and out and in and out uh, yeah. <laughs> of, 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 of the institution. I think he uses the word institution. Um, and then obviously, if you go back to, to the, the opening scene, in and out quite literally means screwed. Yeah, so, yeah, so he's yeah. basically saying you, if, if you don't uh, reform, you'll end up screwed by the institution. Yeah, it is Alex's term for sex, and as you say, another term, screwed. Great, great uh, little twist on the language there. Also, thinking about it now, I am thinking, like, even the his position in the church, even though they're kind of combating how you reach goodness, they're still there trying to achieve the same kind of controlling goals of everyone must be good and follow the line. You know, you, you need to find your goodness from within but he's still trying to find that and i think you know it when they're talking about goodness it almost means you know falling in line with what the government is saying rather than an inherent natural goodness in people although clearly there are also you know things that alex does that are just heinous and horrible yeah i'm i'm not going to argue with that point chug <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, and then we meet the Minister of the Interior, who kind of offers Alex this new treatment, where, you know, they're all being very coy on what it is, and we don't learn until he is literally getting the treatment. Um, but yeah, he, he agrees, because it will get him out of jail within two years, and that's all he wants. He doesn't think about any kind of consequences. There is also, I think, a really interesting scene in here where he talks to the prison governor, and the prison governor's stance on what the need for jail is, is eye for an eye justice. Um, I don't know how many of you did A-level sociology, but I did. And uh, kind of one of the things we talked about was what is the purpose of, you know, the incarceration system? Is it a deterrent? Is it a punishment? Is it retribution? Is it to rehabilitate which ultimately should be rehabilitate although not in the ways they do in this film yeah um which is you know obviously in this film it's more about kind of getting people out of the prisons than actually making them better members of society and helping them improve um but yeah the fact that the prison governor is you know this is about eye for an eye it's about justice is kind of really sums up what is often wrong with prison systems yeah, yeah. I think that 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 scene follows straight on from the scene with Alex and and the uh, and the minister. Uh, sorry, the reverend. Um, if I say minister, it will confuse with the minister. Of yeah. the interior. <laughs> he's having the chat with the reverend about and and demonstrating a real kind of appetite to to improve and be better. And it, it seems again, you get that glimpse of of the kind of sociopathic nature of Alex because he he's, he just shows a real kind of lack of understanding of what it means to be good and he's looking mm. for the quick answer he's mm. looking for the well well why can't why can't i just be good i want to be good and um and the the reverend then then says to him oh well, i wouldn't i wouldn't undertake the the treatment because it should come from within and my my take on that was was despite the um the desire of this inmate to reform the system isn't giving him what he needs to reform and so it, it's no, it's no kind of, um, it's no surprise that he ends up taking taking a shortcut and the quick route um, and the easy route, and and ends up coming up short. Mm. Yeah, really yeah. great point. Then we reach the, uh, and I'm going to mess this up. Lud- Ludovico, is it? Yes. Yeah, the Ludovico Center, where he will uh, receive the Ludovico treatment. Which is essentially being drugged, having your eyes clamped open and forced to watch violent things while the drugs induce terror and nausea in you so you negatively asso- associate violence with uh, with those things. Um, yeah, This is a, as you say, this is a horrible scene. A um, couple of little tidbits on this as well. Malcolm McDowell, like he had his eyes clamped open and like his corneas got scratched by those um, and he was temporarily blinded by it. Uh, also, the the person who is dropping eye drops in his eyes throughout, 
That's an actual doctor who was there to ensure his eyes didn't get dried out. <laughs> well, I was going to say, like, surely if this is real, I mean, you'd need to actually yeah. administer the treatment. Yeah, I believe yeah. he did have like some kind of anaesthetic stuff going on to like make it a bit easier on him, yeah. but still. I mean, um, Sh- Shuggy, Shuggy and myself are both uh, glasses wearers, and, um, yes. and I don't know about you, Shuggy, but this is this is a real kind of barrier I've got to contact lenses that I put down oh, no, on, I, al- almost exclusively I, to this film. That I, I hate the idea of things <laughs> near my eyes because of this incredibly powerful scene. Yeah. I, I do have some contact lenses and have worn them in the past and uh, I'm quite happy to touch my eye and enjoy it as a little party trick to freak people out. I think that says uh, something something about you, Shuggy. Yeah, <laughs> probably fair. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think from kind of like a production point of view, you know, we've, we've had conversations about um, how far directors are willing to go um, on set and, and sort of for lack of a better phrase, what blurs the line between, you know, acting and safety and, you know, what's actually reasonable and responsible. Um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on kind of whether this crosses a line, whether this is sort of, I mean, a lot of this stuff would ordinarily be done with prosthetics, I assume. Um, So, yeah, I mean, what, what do you think? know for the 70s that's probably kind of harder to do this with prosthetics probably yeah. as well also it's you know we obviously we talk a lot about directors doing it and kubrick is obviously well known as not being the world's most accommodating director mm, yeah i i don't know how malcolm mcdowell felt about doing this or you know whether he was completely in for it or not so that also does shape that uh michael what were your kind of thoughts on that yeah i guess um i guess th- this the, the practice that he's describing of clamp, clamping your eye open and then using eye drops to keep your eye lubricated is, is, is widespread today in terms of that. That's the process of if you get laser eye surgery, they, they have to do something very similar. Um, so on the face of it, I'm like, it, it can definitely, it can be safe, but you definitely don't get that impression from from the technology of the 70s and, and, and like you said that his, his cornea ends up getting scratched and and he's, mm. he's definitely got got some lasting damage there but um my, my kind of take is um is is that of informed consent and if uh, if mcdowell is is committed to to the scene and and aware of the risks involved and he's and he's that passionate to get to get the scene that Kubrick's looking for and is and is on board. Then uh, more more power to him. But um, but yeah, I'm, I I would be uh, wary of the information present present at uh, at the point in time of filming would be would be as uh, up to what we now know. Yeah, I will also say like thank God they had a doctor you know standing there and incorporated him into the film like. They they had some level of protection there, at least yeah, yeah. Um, and then the thing that really makes him turn against this whole treatment is the fact that they used Ludwig van Beethoven. It always really annoys me that he calls it Lu- him Ludwig van throughout the film. Like that's just it's so weird because it's Beethoven. Like just, just use the surname. Beethoven is um, also as many syllables as. Ludwig van so it just kind yeah. of is almost like they've just gone oh no let's just let's use the same number of syllables but just the other end of the phrase I mean it's distinctive it's a character choice for sure and it, and it's also like um, Lud- Ludwig is ov- obviously the first name and then yeah. if you're going to say anything you'd say van Beethoven as his yeah. full full surname but he's kind of chopping and changing the, t- the two and sticking half of one into the half of the other and I wonder whether I that's could... deliberate to kind of show he's he's got that aspiration of of mm. being an intellectual and being part of the, that's that circle in society, but but ultimately he's he's not quite there. Yeah, you know, I was as you were talking there, I was just thinking that exact same thing. Like maybe that is a deliberate move to kind of show his, you know, he's he's thinks he's got this kind of intellectual superiority to people because he listens to Beethoven. But yeah, maybe it's kind of to show he doesn't. Anyway, the point we're making, uh, the the kind of 
plot point here that's key is that they use his Ninth Symphony in some of as sort of a backing score to these horrible, horrible, violent videos they're showing him. Uh, so not only does he get an adverse reaction to the violence and the sex, he also gets an adverse reaction to Beethoven's Ninth. And you which, and you get that uh, powerful scene where uh, where Alex says, "Oh, I, I recognise this song. Um, hmm. what, what's going on here? I don't." And he, he shows some kind of semblance of awareness as to what's what's going to happen, and um, and you get the the kind of leader of the um, of the of the of the trial say, "Oh well, can't be helped," and you get that kind yeah. of sense of uh, the the means justify the ends. Because... And he's little. He has a little line in there about maybe this is his punishment. Yes. So they're Absolutely. still kind of thinking about, you know, this is all as punitive and as, you know, revenge based. Yeah, well, it brings into question actually how focused on rehabilitation the system is. And, you know, the fact that I, th- I think it's also kind of we don't see him leave prison and struggle for work or struggle to kind of obviously we see him struggle to rebuild relationships and stuff but we we don't see that kind of economic impact that it has on him um which well now to be fair he he doesn't have much time for it to be any economic impact as he goes pretty much from leaving prison to kicked out of house because he's they've got a lodger to being drowned and then ending up in the hospital. Yeah, I think it does take about 20 minutes. So, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I think it, it's kind of, we don't see him struggling to fit back into society in the same way. You know, obviously he's he does have to move out of his house, but that's not necessarily mm. because he's simply, because he's been to prison. And, and it could be a nod to those struggles that, you know, um, people that have come out of prison genuinely do struggle with but for me that was represented in the way that his love of of Beethoven was destroyed um and tampered with and that he had to deal with the aftermath of that even after leaving prison and it's kind of like you know the way that being in prison and and what they do there and how it runs will follow you even once you've left and that there is no escaping that, you know, the way that you related to society before going to prison has been completely and utterly altered and will be forever because of your experience yeah. in prison and because you've been to prison in the first place. Yeah, Absolutely. We're, we're you, get, you get that kind of wonderful question of um, what what does rehabilitation mean? Does rehabilitation mean, as, as you kind of get a feeling for in this film, that, that you just show no risk of reoffending, and your reoffending rate, you know, goes go right goes right down. Or is it that step further of we want you to contribute to society? Well, the and... two are, the two are linked. Um, recidivism is a huge thing. People reoffending because you know someone comes out of jail and then immediately people won't give them jobs because they've been in jail. People won't you know let them rent apartments stuff like that because they've been in jail they don't trust them. yeah exactly and that drives them to reoffend. and you know by the end of the film alex is cured for his mind he's back to who he was um and i'll talk later about the kind of last chapter that isn't in there but he does in the short term go back to life of crime yeah exactly and and i think you know um just that sort of um inability to reconnect with society for me was highlighted by the way that Beethoven was ruined for him and that kind of continued beyond his experience in jail yeah um so yeah that's kind of gone deep on that it's good discussion I think and uh, he as we kind of mentioned about kind of what happens when he gets out um but there is before before we see all that there is the kind of sequence of him being shown off you know he is very clearly a political pawn for these people which obviously then comes back when the minister of the interior is like telling him that the other people are using him as a political pawn it's like well Mm. what were you doing um and we kind of get these demonstrations where he's assaulted and beaten by this actor apparently malcolm mcdowell actually broke a rib in this scene um 
And then we also see him try and touch a topless woman and immediately finds himself nauseated and can't do it. And you know, obviously the people in the government are you know clapping themselves on the back and giving themselves a big one. Although the chaplain again does speak up and says you know it's a removal of free will. Um, you can't. Which yeah, yeah you, no, that's... You, get, you get that wonderful bit of um, of, of of drama where uh, where he's licking the shoe and and mm. that's and that's and that to me was so more so much more powerful than him getting kicked in the ribs um, because he's lick my shoe and you're like oh is it, it how, how far is how far is this going to go and he does it repeatedly and, and he's he's desperate to get out of that situation um, and then and then completely on the nose there's no there's there's nothing left to the audience's imagination here with with the uh with the reverend speaking all of our minds saying hang on he's he's got no free will is this is this is it is he now genuinely good just because he can't do bad because he he's robbed of the ability to choose this is literally like fascist wet dream like people don't have free will (laughs) they just have to do what we say yeah and you know we spent all most of season two talking about fighting fascists, so you know where we stand on that one. <laughs> yeah, Michael, you just have um, to listen. For the record, I am also against fascism. Yeah, just in oh, case careful, anybody was umming and ahhing. <laughs> yeah, there, there, <laughs> there, are, people, there are people out there who are friend onto the onto the podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you want you want to be careful. There are people who are against people that are anti-fascist. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I I'll be careful not to plug my socials to to, to, <laughs> to attract attract those trolls. So then, yeah, we kind of get to see his life uh, when he gets out. His parents have rented out his room. Uh, the police have sold off his stuff. His pet his pet snakes died. Apparently, the pet snake was included because Malcolm McDowell is scared of snakes, and that was just a prank by Stanley Kubrick. Great. <laughs> it was just a prank. See, I, see, see. There, I think we've got another question of, um, of, is is that really necessary? Is that abuse? Is that greater abuse than the uh, than the specific purposeful abusive scene? Because so, uh, as a uh, arachnophobe, that would that would that would mess with my head. Yeah, I mean, the way like it was suggested in reading about it is that this was a prank. Like this was meant to be a joke. This wasn't meant to be like psychological torture, like he did to Shelley Duvall in The Shining. Um, so it, it seemed like maybe he had a bit of a better relationship with Malcolm McDowell and could kind of get away with that. I don't know, but as a, yeah, as I say, like I, I'm not privy to the relationship. Um, it's, and I feel like the kind of potentially negative conversations come from what we know about Kubrick as a person and as a sort of authoritative figure. Yes, I do. I do think it it, um, it adds to uh, to to the film in in some respects because you've got this this character that shows a complete inability to connect with, with people as a sociopath. And uh, yeah, he shows the only compassion he shows is towards this, this snake that lives in a, in a box under his bed. Yeah. And he genuinely is very upset at the moment that he learns the snake dies. Um, and then kind of Joe, who's the lodger is actually, his parents are still kind of very, his parents are just very placid people, but Joe kind of stands up and calls him out and, refuses to accept him and has just almost co-opted his life as the kid of these two people yeah the arrogance (laughs) that this guy shows in this scene is just astounding like the way that he he feels in entitled to speak on his parents behalf and have a go at their kid after taking his room is just yeah outstanding i think uh looking at from from today's perspective you've got um, you've got Joe, very much the voice of the um, the media informed um, uh, opinion poll, I guess, who, <laughs> who, who who's read an article about what what Alex has done, and no, no, he's read ha- a headline. A, he's read a headline, and that's exactly. It. And therefore, the therefore, therefore, possesses the right to pass judgment and ultimately kick Alex out of out of his family home, and and very much lead the charge of of. Um, of the exclusion on his parents' behalf. Are you right. suggesting that this was Stanley Kubrick predicting cancel culture? Well, well, because I'm willing to go with it. We've gone, we've gone for bigger leaps before. <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, I don't think he would have predicted the speed of cancel culture within social or exacerbated by social media. 
but you've definitely got got newspapers on that coffee table mm. and and Joe saying I read about what you've done I know all about yep. it therefore I, I I'll I'll console your mother I know she's the real victim here you need to get out and and no kind of no attempt to understand the other side of the story yeah well it kind of it kind of feels very much like um you know that kind of we've i don't want to talk about brexit i really don't but you know we've we've been we've been over the last several years we've heard and listened to politicians go we're going to give the people what they want plainly ignoring that there's still 48 plus percent that think brexit is an awful idea (laughs) and like just this sort of uh, this kind of assumption based on what you think you know um and and this sort of very polarized position that you've taken based on the limited or or the manipulated information that you've decided to ingest and and try and apply that to you know to to the wider society you know it's 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 a depiction of somebody living in an echo chamber effectively um and and it's yeah. kind of just condensed into one person and that's not something i i noticed i mean mikey that's a great observation i didn't pick up on that but yeah it's a really good point i think it, it goes it goes even further because if you were to kind of take take that step back you could kind of notice how quickly the media narrative and rhetoric changes and all of a sudden all of a sudden alex is is the victim and you're hearing the other side of the story, but it's always to somebody else's agenda. It's never, mm. it's never from his perspective. It's always he's he's the side piece in somebody else's story for somebody else's agenda. Never, never kind of focusing on on him and his re- rehabilitation and, and what his what his um, um, dog in the race would be. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you I even so. even at the end of the film, you're still kind of wondering. Wait, is he the victim, or you know what's going on here? And and I mean, I think that's partially set up because you know that opening sequence is just so dreadful, and you know that first sort of half an hour is is so kind of brutal that you know you're led to believe that he is awful, and then by the end of it, you're kind of you don't know where to where you land, and um, and obviously that you can't. You can't deny that everything he did was awful, but you also can't deny that the way he was treated was absolutely inhumane. And and then you have this kind of, you're right, you have like this yo-yoing of the media and you never actually get to, he's never asked about how he feels about it, you know? He's just, he, you. the way you follow him through this story is you just watch him suffering. Beyond that point of prison, you just watch him suffer. and And everything you hear... Um, and and the analysis of what's going on is fed to you by the media and the people around him, just not him. Yeah, these are all great points, and um, I love like Michael, you picking up on that kind of little detail that Nye and I missed. I think that's where this film is so good. Is you know we mentioned earlier, it, it, at times the metaphors are not subtle, and then at times they are. Um, and we got in kind of another one where you know he is picked up by two policemen and they're, you know, his former Drew, Stim and Georgie. And, you know, it's nothing ever stated there, but obviously kind of the fact that these ultra-violent kids have then gone on to become policemen is kind of clearly meant to be a representation and a comment on the police itself as well. Absolutely, absolutely. That's uh, that's one of the, I guess, less less subtle of nods from Kubrick that uh, mm. that you've got this uh, this violent gang that end up being arguably one of the most violent gangs of the times. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, anyway, so those two drag him out to the countryside, beat him, drown him nearly to death, and then leave him there. And he crawls to a house, and what do you know? It's Frank Alexander from the opening of the film. Um, we meet his kind of... Is he meant to be like his manservant? I'm not entirely sure. Uh-oh. Um Julian. No idea. Played by David played by David Prowse, who is uh, probably best known as the physical performance of Darth Vader. Oh really? Yes. Love that. This is so this is Darth Vader in the flesh. <laughs> wow. Um and credit to Kubrick here, the scene where he has to carry uh Frank down the stairs in the wheelchair. 
Um, so David Prowse was a bodybuilder, and you know, obviously he's a big buff bloke. Uh, he did come to Kubrick and said, I know you're not known for doing stuff in one take. Can we get this in as few takes as possible? And uh, Stanley Kubrick, obviously known for doing thousands of takes sometime, uh, he said he'll do his best and they would got it in six. Um, but yeah, so Frank doesn't recognise Alex as the person who attacked him and his wife, but he does immediately recognise him as the person from the paper who is this potential political pawn. And again, it's clearly meant to be, you know, this is kind of a both sides are not great comment. Like, you know, even on this is clearly the more left left wing side of things, you know, they're still just using Alex to kind of achieve their own aims and take down the government. Yeah, well, it's everybody adopting an agenda, isn't it? And it's it's kind of like that, that sort of back and forth and, and that kind of party political um dynamic of of the government and how you know they can they can manipulate things to work in either direction which of course you know that party political though that kind of um dynamic is not as prominent at the moment but um you know for for the last for the majority of our lifetime we've experienced how you know you've we've seen propaganda it's the same propaganda used in different ways to serve different agendas and to serve different purposes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, uh, you you end up of getting that um, that sense of you know, you're not able to see see the wood for the trees, and you you've got Alex that is just uh, just um. I'm wary of using the cliche of uh, he's just a statistic, but he he just <laughs> ends up being being a uh, a stepping stone on either side, mm-hmm. and absolutely like you said, and I he's uh, he's symptomatic of of neither side being um, being being clean of hand. Yeah, you know, neither side is actually interested in helping him. They're just interested in how can he help themselves. Um, and then he kind of gives himself away. He sing. He's getting a bath, and he's uh, starts singing, singing in the rain. Again, this obviously isn't in the book because it was something Kubrick invented. Instead, it's kind of you know more series of small mistakes in the book, and I I like this more because it just calls back to that you know really horrific opening in such a brutal way. Um, and obviously, Frank is completely devastated he has this really kind of emotional talk where he doesn't reveal to Alex that he knows it's him but he's telling him about you know his wife's died and he blames the person who you know broke in and raped her um which I, I, th- I think that that in itself is quite a um um I, d- I don't know I don't know enough about the time to say whether it's ahead of its time but it mm. certainly goes into quite a lot of detail around that whole idea of PTSD and, and the lasting effects of trauma yeah. beyond beyond that of the physical um, which is I, I think a, a nice kind of recognition from Kubrick of the severity of of the victims left behind mm. whilst you're also focusing on 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 Alex as as a protagonist I think it definitely is because deliberate because you know this whole kind of little sequence is all about kind of psychological issues and trauma you know Alex obviously talks to um Frank's colleagues about you know when he hears Beethoven's ninth now he gets suicidal feelings you know it's clearly this sequence is it uh meant to be an exploration of the psychological effects and the trauma yeah, and um, what I find really interesting about this moment where, you know, he he hears Alex singing is this is kind of where you see um, the personal vendetta come out. And this guy is meant to be a socialist writer. You know, he's meant to be um, kind of f- full way left of centre. And you see that kind of switch in agenda when he when he has an, a personal attachment to it and then suddenly the style of the film changes and it kind of reverts back to how it was at the beginning and mm-hmm. and then now all of a sudden you can't differentiate between the good guys and the bad guys because 
the way that it's filmed and the way that it's acted you know it's got that very kind of um over the top quite kind of abstract sort of acting the stuff that you you sort of see in deltoid at the beginning you know yeah and and suddenly there's that there's that kind of ambiguity between who stands for what and 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 you see almost that kind of corruption of the left because they have a personal agenda going on as well it's a great point i do wonder you know if he hadn't realized that alex had been the one um what the kind of plan was was the plan to you know drive him to try and kill himself as he does or was it just to use him to kind of you know un un kind of veil the what has happened to him through you know public speaking and telling his story um whereas yeah obviously the way they end up going is they try and have him kill himself and then they can literally dictate the narrative through telling his story yeah it's hard to say um i do want yeah i do wonder if he hadn't revealed what way would uh, frank and his colleagues have gone who knows mm. Yeah, it's a really, really, really interesting thought experiment. And I guess what you end up with is the complete opposite with the, the victim ending up going into the, the same system that has failed Alex. And you end up getting getting a, a sense of, you know, purely, purely financially, right? You've got um, so much kind of taxpayers' money being spent on Alex as um, as as the perpetrator and the, the culprit in, in the justice system say, so, right, we're going to spend a huge amount on this experimental treatment um, to, to, to make sure that we're, we're saving, and it's, you know, arguably forward thinking, we're, we're going to save money in future because we're going to try and reform you. Um, and then ultimately the system fails, fails the people within the system, which adds more people into the system and, and the cycle, the cycle, um, reenacts itself with with the added cherry on top that uh, that Alex is being offered this cushy job from from the government. Yeah, with extra so get, pay essentially as hush money. Yeah, you, you get you get a cherry of corruption on top. Yeah, yeah I mean it's you know it, it, it's kind of people failing upwards and and actually I guess a real sort of literal depiction of the people in government are criminal <laughs> i mean yeah it's, are you, in its sorry, most sorry, basic no, form are you are you, su are you suggesting that our most trusted government could be could be guilty of corruption in this day and age uh, and handing out jobs to people that they know and just want to you know ensure that they 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 are on side i'm not sure i'd ever suggest such a thing i'd outright say no. it i'm not sure i'd ever <laughs> suggest it <laughs> right we'll we'll quickly move on um uh, yeah, we've kind of touched on this final scene where he, you know, obviously he, he's nearly driven to suicide through the playing of Beethoven's Ninth, jumps out a window, ends up in hospital. The minister for the interior comes by and we've kind of gone through this scene. But the kind of final thing we get is uh, he brings in speakers and photographers because, you know, this needs to be a publicity moment. Of course. Um, of them, you know, cuddling up and having, you know, looking chummy plays Beethoven's Ninth, and instead of kind of the revulsion and suicide from Alex, he's uh, able to picture himself having sex in front of a crowd, and the final line of narration of I was cured alright. Brilliant. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. Masterful ending. Um, as quite, I, as quite I mentioned of the a season, of episode one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the strong start. It's yeah. a strong start for a bubble. Um, as I mentioned, there is kind of a final chapter of the book that was cut out of uh, the US publication and uh, Kubrick also didn't want it in this film um, where essentially Alex ends up he gets a new gang but he kind of becomes more half-hearted in his violence over time uh, he meets up with Pete again who has kind of reformed and has been married and eventually Alex kind of just contemplates whether he's going to just give up the violence and all of this completely and become a functioning member of society if you will um, this was seen as like really inconsistent in the tone with the rest of the book by most people, uh, including, as I say, the US publishers and Kubrick, who were just like, get this out. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want it. Like, obviously, as you say, yeah, this kind of ending is so impactful. It leaves, it, it's not on the nose in like kind of other ways, but it, uh, 
as, as this final chapter can be a bit on the nose, but it um, yeah, it just leaves you to explore the ideas yourself, which is what I love in a good ending. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You get that sense of um, of taking taking the shortcut will never lead to to a lasting a lasting change and a lasting result. You end up you know sticking sticking a band aid over the issue, which is a temporary fix, but but you're not addressing addressing the institutionalized issues which uh which you know is quite quite ironic that the government end up quite literally spoon feeding alex when when that's what mm, yes they're, they're try, trying to avoid doing yeah. at the outset of the film yeah i think yeah, yeah i mean right. there is literal spoon feeding <laughs> <laughs> there's a really good point um yeah i think i think that would have been a cop out to be honest i think it would have undermined everything that could have been taken from this film and ultimately you know we've i think in this conversation we've we've kind of picked apart quite a bit of it and and you know i think that would have been sort of undermined and overshadowed um by this final chapter had they kept it in i also yeah i i like kind of when art is left open to interpretation like we can pull out what we want from the ending of it um if you, if you want some hints of when this was recorded i'm going to mention um the Disney Pixar film Luca came out uh, this summer. Yeah, just seen it actually. Yeah, um, the director has said very explicitly that he says there is no home of uh, homosexual overtones to that film whatsoever. Um, whereas obviously a lot of people have seen it and read kind of the central relationship between the two male male characters as being a gay one, and there is essentially a coming out story in there. And it really annoys me that the director's kind of come out and said, no, absolutely not. Like, let people interpret your art. Like, don't don't put constrictions on it. If people want to, if people can read that into what you're doing, let people interpret the art in the way you want, unless it is, you know, completely against your worldview. Um, which I assume that's not, because... Absolutely. I wonder whether that's a classic case of, um, of the commercial um, implications of, of what the statement would be. But you know, com- coming back to coming back to a Clockwork Orange and the ending, I, I think it's hugely pertinent that the story doesn't have a happy ending. Yeah, I think that adds that adds so much more to the story because we're all stuck in this in this cycle of 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 growing um, of growing um, institutionalized inequality, and and if it was a happy ending, I think I think. That wouldn't leave you with the same kind of in sense of injustice that, mm. that I think you should be feeling after watching the film. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. yeah. And there's this, you know, there's ultimately there's this kind of moment where I, I was like, this this guy is he's lying in bed in a hospital bed. He is head to toe in a cast. He's had to had to be spoon fed and manipulated into signing a contract with the government and. You know he he's been tortured and he's made to feel thankful for it. Yeah. You know yeah, th- that kind absolutely. of that sort of you know the way that they clearly the government have come to him trying to make amends because they know it saves it covers their own back, but they've also somehow managed to make him feel lucky to be in the position mm. he's in, and you know we see this all the time. You know, we see oh, yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. We see this kind of how grateful we should be for you know free healthcare at the point of use or whatever, and 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 this kind of things that should be a given. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, I just think that that's kind of another sort of really poignant point, and in that kind of end moment. Yeah, yeah. This has been a very unpolitical episode yeah. of the Zodiac podcast. <laughs> so I'll wrap up with a little bit of post-production. Uh, so the film was released in 1971, and it was a huge box office success. Like this film had a budget of like 1.3 million dollars, and it grossed well over 100 million dollars. Uh, the initial reviews were mixed. Some were hugely supported it, loved it. Some uh, were very against it. Some thought it was a mess. Some thought it didn't necessarily work based on the original novel and some were just very against it on moral grounds more of that in a bit um it's the current kind of critical consensus of it is that it's really is really strong 
Um, 86% on Rotten Tomatoes and an average rating of 8.8 out of 10. Uh, It was nominated for a bunch of awards. It got four Oscar nominations, Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay, Best Editing, and seven BAFTA nominations. So the four categories I've just mentioned, as well as production design, cinematography, and soundtrack. It didn't win any, but it, you know, it was in the awards pictures. It's one of only two X-rated films to ever get nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars, along with Midnight Cowboy. But there were some controversies. So let's start in America. Um, as I say, it was given an X rating on its initial release. Uh, Kubrick actually cut about 30 seconds of sexually explicit footage in order to get an R rating on a re-release later in 1972. Um it was also widely condemned by religious groups. Uh, so the National Office for... Uh, so a, a, Roman, a Catholic um, office of film basically said Roman Catholics should not see this film. <laughs> uh, and a group called the Conference of Bishops labelled it as morally offensive. So... It really riled up the religious people in America. It's it's quite ironic that I, f- I feel like those controversies and those those critiques of the film add to the film's narrative of <laughs> of, of of the institutions and the mm. control over 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 the people. Yeah. In yes. Society. I will. I will say that the group saying you're a Roman Catholic shouldn't shouldn't see it. I think the term is they are forbidden from seeing it. <laughs> Um, so in the UK, so it was originally allowed to be shown uncut in British cinemas. However, there were a number of kind of trials where this film was mentioned. So uh, a manslaughter trial of a 14-year-old boy, as well as the murder trial of a 16-year-old boy, the film got mentioned as being like inspiration for them, as well as I believe there was a rape case as well where it got kind of referenced. Um Sandy Kubrick's wife kind of revealed that the family had received threats and protesters had gathered outside their home and uh, eventually in 1973 it was withdrawn from British release at the request of Kubrick although he did disagree that the film that his film was to blame I think they just essentially wanted the harassment to stop probably um so it was really difficult to see A Clockwork Orange in the UK for about 27 years and it was only re-released again after Kubrick's death in 1999 Wow, that recent. Yeah, that's mad. Um, it's really crazy. It has also been banned and/or censored in a number of other countries, including Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, South Korea, parts of Canada, and Brazil. Um, yeah, huge amount of countries have uh, basically been. We're not showing this for a long time until it was either re-edited or eventually kind of. Attitudes changed a bit, yeah. Um, but it's had a huge cultural impact. It's often listed on like best movies of all time list. I think most notably, Empire ranked it as the thirty seventh greatest movie ever made. And wow. uh, that's all I've got for pre uh, post production. Nice. Uh, so, final thoughts on the film, uh, Nye. Yeah, I mean, as I said at the beginning, like I was tentative going into this, um, a little bit apprehensive, just because I'd seen it. I thought I'd seen it um, and kind of properly watched it and turns out I hadn't. Um, I did actually really enjoy it. Um, I thought that, you know, getting a chance to kind of really read into it a, a lot more and discuss it as as we have um, has just put this film in a whole different light for me. And yeah, thanks. Great pick, Mikey. Yeah, I'm in a similar kind of boat. As I say, first time I saw it, it was in amongst all of Kubrick's work. And I think Kubrick is a great filmmaker. Um, And I think this is an incredibly well-made film. So many incredible technical aspects. Uh, The one, sadly, that was missing from all those award stuff was Malcolm McDowell, who I think is amazing as Alex. Um, And as I say, like I kind of came off watching this before we started the podcast going, I'm not entirely sure where... It was meant to be going all the time and what Kubrick was saying. But the fact that we've got to sit down and discuss it and hash this stuff out uh, and it's become even clearer and even a stronger film, its messages have become stronger, um, that's great filmmaking. The fact that it can incite such great discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic pick, Mike. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm glad you guys have enjoyed. I think you... With this, um, with this film and this type of film, you get so much more out of it being in this kind of environment where you can say, have a bit of a discussion about the metaphors. Was he was the director doing this? Was the actor trying to to do this? And and overlaying the kind of the uh, 
at times absolutely kind of beautiful creative dialogue that's going on with with all, all of the characters in a really kind of wacky way is uh is uh is great and and i think it's aged really well as well yeah which, uh, was another thing that i kind of noticed on on rewatching. yeah absolutely uh so that's going to do it for us talking about clockwork orange yeah. uh nye you're going to be picking next week's film what have you got for us i am so um this was the first 18 rated film i ever saw unsurprisingly i was not 18 mm. did actually get <laughs> in trouble for watching it because it was at a friend's house um so my parents hadn't given me permission um although no. retrospectively i don't know why they thought that would make a difference because given the other stuff they let me watch i mean yeah. it wasn't much of a leap um <laughs> it, it has been briefly mentioned this film um in last season when we were talking about one of the greatest openings or the greatest film openings um, oh i think i know what this is i don't think you do are we going superhero or comic? Book? Oh, no, okay, yeah, you might know. You might okay, know. I think I might have mentioned it, it actually. I got it. Um, so, my pick for next week's episode is going to be Blade. Yes! Um, I'm so excited. Yeah, I mean, I just. I don't remember too much about it, um, but I, I do remember that opening scene. And no, I, I want to I wanna say right now. Uh, congratulations on your pick winning the bubble for best film quote of the season. What can uh, I say? Which is, some mother effers are always trying to ice skate uphill. There we go. We've we've topped Clockwork Orange in episode two. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's, my, that's my pick for, for next week. And I'm that's going to be awesome. It. Yeah. And Mikey, I'm sorry that you can't join us next week. Well, I mean, you can. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm reconsidering my pick. I might, I might uh, re-watch it in advance of your episode and, uh, and listen along with you guys. Yeah, give it a watch. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, Nye, I think you've got a bit of a closer for us this week. Yes. So I just thought um, it actually just popped into my head talking about, you know, the psychology behind Clockwork Orange. And at the time of watching or recording this episode um, about four days ago. So on Saturday, on the most recent weekend, I went to watch a show called The Money. And it was really interesting. So it's it's not a typical show. It's more like a game show. And you can pay to either be a silent witness or a player. And the concept is, is that you buy in as a player um, and all the money that gets raised from people that buy in as a player goes into the middle of a table and all the players sit around this table and they have to decide unanimously on what to spend the money on and they okay. have an hour to decide and if they don't spend the money if they can't decide for whatever reason um, then that money gets rolled over and added to the table for the next show um, as a silent witness, you cannot talk, you have to just observe. However, you can choose on the spot to get up, buy in and join the table. And this can give you the chance to kind of dispute what's being ta- discussed or bring your own idea or simply just to join in support. Um, the really interesting thing about this was the psychology behind it and watching this kind of group mentality form Um, People came to the table with different ideas. When they felt outnumbered, they quite quickly um, sort of retreated and joined the majority. Um, And what was the most interesting thing, so they did actually end up deciding what to spend the money on. Um, But what was really interesting was at the the end of the, the one hour time limit, somebody from the audience spoke out and said, oh, I think it's awful what you've decided on because of, I don't know, they, I I couldn't really hear what they were saying, but they heavily disputed the decision. Um, And it was just kind of interesting to thinking about kind of why they hadn't bought in and actively gone and, you know, argued their case. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of a really interesting experience sort of considering the psychology behind it, you know, how people respond when they feel under pressure or where they know they're being watched and, you know, how willing to stand by their arguments they are under certain circumstances. Um, so yeah, that was, I, 
I'd be horrible on this show. My pitch would just be, we should spend all the money on buying me Magic the Gathering cards. <laughs> a Black Lotus is over ten thousand pounds. Well, there. I mean, two. There apparently there was a couple that um, did get their honeymoon contributed to. Um, oh. So, yeah, um, and you know, some some people this group that we watched decided to contribute it to one of one of the people. There was a teacher and pitched that they wanted to. Um, they had kind of like a PTA style. Um, group that had been underfunded since or had lost or out on money since the pandemic hit and stuff and um, but yeah it was just very interesting to watch the dynamics of the psychology and you know and people just kind of interacting with each other and um, yeah so I don't know if you've got anything that you want to add to that or your experience of anything like that but that was just something that I thought would be quite interesting and given that we've spoken about A Clockwork Orange and how you know people kind of a um tend to sort of fall in line when they feel um, manipulated or when they feel cornered. Um, is, well, the, yeah. the immediate thing that jumps into my mind while you're talking about that was, do you remember the show Golden Balls? No, Mikey says uh, he does, okay. I do not. Okay, well, so it was a game show and the final round of Golden Balls was, it ended up with two people and they each get a choice. Of do they split the pot of money or do they take uh, the pot of money? Yes, okay. And I've if seen they both clips say of this. split, yeah. Yeah. So if they both play split, they split it. If one says split and one says take, um, I think the one who says split gets all the money. Or no one gets money in that case, is it? No, no, sorry, if one says split and one says take, the one who says take gets all the money. If both say take, no one gets money, sorry, yeah. Right. Um and there's kind of really interesting psychology in that as well. Mm. Of because there's a small period where they can talk, I think, and kind of try and come to some kind of decision. Yeah. And uh, I think there's one really famous episode where someone basically says, I'm going to take the money. If you put take, then nothing happens here. So you should put split. And he spent the whole thing just being like, I'm saying take, you got to put split or we're just losing this money. Yeah. And then I think they end up revealing that they've also put split. Right. And it's like this really iconic um, moment of it, yeah. yeah. But again, really interesting kind of the psychological, almost mind games. Of yeah, that. yeah. And, and you know, like I think what kind of dawned on me afterwards as well is that there was this kind of, adam- they were adamant from the beginning that they had to spend this money and that they couldn't let it roll over. Whereas actually, if, you're, if your intention is genuinely to do some good, there's no reason why, you know, they couldn't have thought what what happens if we don't spend this money and we let it roll over to the next sh- next show and ultimately what might potentially end up happening is that that money accumulates and goes towards something and actually makes a bigger difference than we would make so it, it was kind of like there was also that element of like immediate gratification and actually are you doing it selflessly or are you doing it because it makes you feel good and so that's what kind of inspires that need to spend the money or yeah so it was it was really interesting any thoughts mike that sounds absolutely fascinating and it sounds like some something uh some some nerdy game that uh that i want to wheel out to uh to my friends at a dinner party and, and <laughs> see and, and see where we where we end up i think it would be a really interesting absolutely. game to play and you know yeah just to see what happens you know i mean i think it's a little different and this is part of the reason why, right? Because I think, you know, if you were sitting, if everybody put in a fiver and you were sitting around and, and you said, okay, only one of us can have the money and they have to take it away and spend it on what we agree on, um, you know, you could, you'd all be pretty comfortable going, right, well, let's just take it and go to the pub and we can split it, you know. And, and people have suggested that. People have, I think people have actually done that as well in this game. I think yeah. that there's there's added pressures. So obviously there's, there's the timing. So there's the time mm. constraint. People know that they are being watched as well being and potentially and judged. judged. Yeah. Um, and also these are people that don't know each other. So it's there's yes. this kind of there's this added layer of how do people interact with under pressure with people that they don't know. Um, and, and also on top of that, 
you know, there's so you have to, they have to, not only can they agree, but they have to sign a contract. So all of them have to unanimously sign this contract. And, um, and it is from, from what I've heard um, since watching it, it is actually a, a legally binding contract. Um, and so, and they, there's kind of, they can arrange how to sort of keep everyone else informed of how the money has been spent, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, there's that pressure of you get locked into something and this kind of expectation that's placed on that. And yeah, it's just really interesting because there's so many dynamics going on at once. And it's almost like it's it's almost like a controlled experiment, apart from it's not quite because no matter what happens, they're always going to be influenced by the fact that they know that they're being watched. Um, so, yeah, it was just a really interesting experience. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder whether the um, again, maybe maybe being a little bit of a, uh, a psychology nerd here, but I wonder whether behind behind closed doors there's a um, there's a control group that have done similar versions of this experiment without the audience watching and and comparing comparing the actions taken by that group of people versus the influence of that audience. Um, but yeah, like like you like you said earlier, I'd be fascinated to pick the brains of. Um, of that audience member that was clearly so so um, so impassioned by the mistakes that the uh, that the participants were making, yet not impassioned not impassioned enough to, to stand up and and quite literally put his money where his mouth is. Yeah, yeah. well, that's that's kind of the point, isn't it? Because you know they they clearly believed in what they were saying but were were they not putting the money down because they didn't believe in it enough or was it because they were worried about what people would think or you know was it because they just wanted to cause a scene and actually they didn't believe what they were saying or you know so it, yeah or or possibly even just because they didn't have the money um so you know it's and and then then brings into you know opportunity and and people's kind of status and how that plays into the way that they kind of um, portray their beliefs and going back to what we were saying about social media a little bit earlier is it is it just a case of it's far easier to criticize something than actually find a find a resolution yeah yeah and it's easier to speak than do Mm. you know so and 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 what's really interesting about that is that you know, she had all these objections, but ultimately it counted for absolutely nothing because she didn't do anything about it. Yeah. And, and, you know, so yeah, it didn't, she, she didn't make a wave. <laughs> so yeah, it was, no, it was, it was really interesting. And, and I just thought in light of what we were speaking about in, in with a clockwork orange, it would just kind of be kind of an, a nice little bolt on. Um, so yeah, yeah that's my absolutely. pleasure. Absolutely, absolutely fantastic closer. Thank you, Nye. And thank you, Michael, once again for coming on and uh, spending your evening with us. It's been a great yeah, pleasure to have you it's on here. It's been a here. pleasure you, to be here and to participate in uh, such, a, such a lovely thought through a discussion with some friends. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, you can find the podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, YouTube, anywhere else you find your podcasts. Let us know if we're not somewhere. We'll we'll try and get it sorted. You can follow us at Nostalgia Bubble on Twitter and at Nostalgia Bubble Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. You can follow me everywhere at Shuggy Says. That's S H U G G I E S Says. And you can follow me on Twitter at Nye Reese N Y E R W E S, and on Instagram at Reese Nye. And you can join us next time for Blade. Bye-bye. See you later.